Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to show you how patriarchy actively harms men. And I'm going to show you how we as men can break this cycle of trauma to live happier, healthier, and longer lives. Now, on the surface, what I'm saying sounds like bullshit. How can patriarchy harm men when by definition, it's a system in which men are given the power and authority to dominate women and society as a whole? How can I stand here and tell you that the very same system that values the masculine over the feminine in every arena of our lives, that pays men 23% more than women for the same work done, harms men? Well, let me try. You see, hegemonic masculinity, which is the belief in male domination over women, has a very specific set of demands. It demands that men be stoic and aggressive, that they don't express their emotion, that they project physical and mental strength at all times, that they're financially successful, and that they assert sexual dominance over women. This hegemonic view of masculinity is limiting as it defines itself in opposition to femininity. If women focus on relationships, men must focus on themselves. If women are caretakers, men must be careless. If women express themselves, men must suppress themselves. In other words, to be a man is simply to not be a woman. Beyond assigning a set of rules that men must follow, patriarchy is also a yardstick that men measure their self-worth against. But it's a yardstick that you'll never measure up to, as patriarchy plants the seeds of self-doubt in every boy's mind to convince him he's not enough. If you buy in, it will convince you that you're not strong enough, you're not assertive enough, you don't gym enough, you don't earn enough, you don't fuck enough, you're not enough. These ways of thinking subtly impact every part of our lives. From the shows we watch, to the way we work out, to the food we order at restaurants. When I think of a frat bro, I don't exactly think of avocado toast or garden salad. But still, these gendered expectations have darker consequences. Supposedly, patriarchy is a system that works for men. But a quick glance at data at the mental health crisis shows that this isn't so true. Given that men are told to scorn anything emotional, it's unsurprising that an article in the Community Mental Health Journal found that men are more likely than women to attribute depression to a person's weakness of character. The Brookings Institute reports on a 2013 study which found that men around the world have consistently lower life satisfaction than women. The literature also suggests that the men who reject traditional masculine norms and practice empathy, self-reflection, and compassion have higher self-esteem than other men. Mental health struggles are part of the human experience, but patriarchy isolates boys by convincing them that they're weak and unmanly if they reach out for help. The National Health Service found that only a third of those who access therapy in the UK are men. I remember I went through a few rough periods in high school and I have a distinct memory of one day I was in our cafeteria. I was standing in the lunch line and I was gazing out the window. I had on that thousand yard stare that I'm sure those of you who have also struggled with depression know so well. You're not looking at anything. You're not feeling anything. You're just numb. But I was shaken out of my little head when one of my loose friends came up to me and said, are you okay? But he framed it as a challenge, not a check-in, as if there was something wrong with being anything but good. And it was in that moment that I internalized the lie that the only right way of handling your emotions is to push them down. And this stigmatizing of struggle this demand that men project strength at all times is exactly why we struggle in silence. It's no surprise then when men try to paper over the cracks by self-medicating. The CDC reports that men are almost twice as likely as women to binge drink and almost three times as likely as women to become alcohol dependent. A close friend of mine says that hurt people hurt people. And this is painfully true when it comes to substance abuse. 
as alcohol is a key risk factor in the perpetration of sexual violence. The Great Bell Hooks said that the first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women. Instead, patriarchy demands of males that they engage in acts of psychic self-mutilation, that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. If a man is unsuccessful at emotionally crippling himself, he can count on patriarchal men to enact rituals of power that will assault his self-esteem. And this last part, mentioning those patriarchal men enacting rituals of power, is what makes masculine social pressures so unique. Those who feel its pain most intensely are the ones who enforce it most actively. Patriarchy is a cycle of trauma enforced by one's peers. I like to say that shame is the body art of patriarchy because it both intensifies and preserves these social pressures. It intensifies them by making you feel there's something fundamentally wrong with you as a person. And it preserves them by discouraging you from speaking up about your struggles. Brene Brown commented in her own TED talk that while guilt says you did something wrong, shame says there's something wrong with you. Guilt is tied to an event while shame is tied to the self. And as a culture, we have ways of talking about guilt. We have ways of handling guilt, like apologizing. But we don't have any of the same conversations or resolutions when it comes to shame. So when we feel ashamed, we draw in on ourselves. We shrink. I said earlier that the same men who feel the pressures of patriarchy most intensely are the ones who enforce it most actively. And this is because of shame. You see, one of the ways that we handle shame when we've been made to feel inadequate or that we don't measure up in some way is by lashing out. In lashing out, we project the same negative feelings that we have towards ourselves onto others. We lift ourselves up by dragging others down. This isn't surprising as we know that men who feel threatened in their masculinity are especially likely to overcompensate. I'm sure all of the guys watching this can remember a time when a man around them told them don't be a bitch as a way of pressuring them into doing something risky or dangerous. Shame is such an effective weapon because it's all consuming. It shrinks the world down to the size of your perceived failures. So for men who feel emasculated, that failure to live up to a masculine ideal becomes all they think about. And then in attempting to avoid that same shame in the future, they project the same damaging and rigid norms about manhood onto other boys. And that is how the cycle of patriarchy continues. I'd like to share a story with you. A story that I haven't shared with anyone before. About how deeply ashamed I was for not being man enough. About a young man in his first days at McGill University who arrived at his residence hall with 700 other new students. All of us excited to start a new chapter in our lives. I remember on my first night of independence I gathered with some neighbors in a dorm room to play drinking games and get to know one another. We awkwardly slouched on the twin beds and stumbled through conversation as we tried not to forget the names of kids that we'd met just 10 minutes prior. But as I splayed across my neighbor's mattress, I noticed that I kept lifting my drink to my lips to try and quiet the butterflies that kept picking up in my stomach. It was only later that I realized these drinking games served as ground zero for the anxieties and self-doubts that we'd all carried with us to our new homes. Do you know the feeling of anxiety when you meet someone new that causes you to overshare? I'm not talking a small overshare, I'm talking that most personal of personal outpourings type overshare. Well, that was everyone in this res and a few drinks in, people were sharing crazy stories about ex-boy or girlfriends or wild sexual conquests and encounters that they'd had in high school. People knew each other's sexual histories before they knew each other's names. Or at least that's how it seemed to me. 
because I had never had sex. And I was ashamed that I'd never had sex. My world shrank down to the size of my perceived failures. So when someone asked me about my sexual history, I panicked. Those butterflies in my stomach kicked up like a cloud of locusts. What do I do? Do I lie? But what if they can tell? And more importantly, would they call me out in front of all the people in this room? Or do I tell the truth? No, the, the truth was embarrassing. The truth was so embarrassing. I was 19. My teenagers were almost over. And I'd never had sex. I'd never had this experience that's glorified and held aloft in songs, movies, group chats, and conversations in the back of the bus. It seemed like the only thing about me that mattered in that moment was the fact I hadn't had this one experience. It felt like everyone my age was laughing about an inside joke that I'd been left out on. It wasn't until years later that I talked with a larger group of friends that I realized I wasn't the only one who had endured this internal crisis. But none of us realized the company we were in because we'd all felt the same shame. We'd all shrunk in on ourselves. The mind can be a very convincing liar and this shame convinced us that we would be rejected if we opened up. This shame convinced us that we were utterly alone and this shame convinced us that we were less of a man. This realization of not being alone was so liberating as it made me realize how beautifully normal I was. And this realization of not being alone is exactly why we need to talk with our boys about the unique pressures that they face. Conversation is the only way that we can break through this shame that convinces us we're not man enough. Conversation is the only way for us to build our boys into the happy and healthy men we know they can be. Adolescence is a time of first for many people. First kiss, first experiences with the drugs and alcohol, first time asking someone out, first time getting rejected. How we learn to handle these experiences shapes our attitudes throughout young adulthood, which is why we need to start this conversation with men while they're still boys. It's our responsibility as men to guide boys through this obstacle course of voices, whispering in their ear that they're not enough. This is why I've created the Modern Manhood Program, which aims to work with boys in Montreal high schools to positively redefine what it means to be a man. By sparking conversation on everything from mental health to body image to one's relationship with sex, we hope to help boys embrace a more authentic version of themselves. When our culture talks about masculinity, it's almost always preceded by the word toxic. We're abandoning our boys when we only show them who they shouldn't be without providing them with all the beautiful examples of who they can be. This is why the Modern Manhood Program centers around positive masculinity, which puts boys back in the driver's seat of their identity. It gives them the space and the freedom to become whoever they want to be without being weighed down by whoever they feel they're supposed to be. For me, Positive masculinity involves the bravery to be vulnerable, the strength to ask for help, the courage to cry, the confidence to offer support, and the maturity to make space for others. You can't be what you can't see, which is why we hope to help boys see all the beautiful examples of manhood that they can embody. Patriarchy tells boys that they aren't enough. Positive masculinity reminds them that they are. Now, I've heard a lot of men express doubt when it comes to conversations around gender as they feel they're being told there's something inherently wrong with being a man or with enjoying traditional masculine activities. This isn't the case. Positive masculinity is there to remind men that they can define manhood for themselves. They can mix and match whichever traits and interests they enjoy. You can chop wood for your cabin and listen to Mariah Carey. You can channel surf between UFC and The Bachelor. You can wear a crop top and play rugby. You can continue to embrace traditional masculine activities if that's what you enjoy. I love watching Sunday Night Football with my guy friends. No one's trying to take that away from you. 
I'm not going to confiscate your scotch and make you drink a white claw. I just want to move our culture away from a place that tells boys there's something wrong with them if they don't enjoy those activities. And that casts them out if they want to follow a different path. Patriarchy tells boys who they should be. Positive masculinity lets them choose. Bell Hooks said that the first act of violence that patriarchy demands of boys is an act of psychic self-mutilation, that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. When we get too caught up in what it means to be a man, we isolate ourselves from the very traits and emotions that make up what it means to be human. In reconnecting boys with their whole selves, we can help the men of tomorrow live happier, healthier, and longer lives. The loneliest feeling in the world is the feeling that you're utterly alone in something. That you're the only person who's feeling a certain type of sadness. I think you're the only one who's not enough. Not smart enough, not confident enough, not funny or charismatic or handsome enough. For too long, patriarchy has convinced boys that they aren't enough. And it's shamed them into silencing their suffering. It's time that we as men start the dialogue to remind boys that they are enough and that they can be whoever they want to be. Thank you.